Welcome back to the world today. Schools of Muslim worshippers have been killed in Pontuscom, Yobe State, after a suicide bomber detonated explosive devices. Witnesses said the Muslim Brotherhood, the Shia, were on procession in Pontuscom Metropolis in observance of the 10th day of Muharram 1436 celebration when the explosion went off among the worshippers, killing scores of those in the procession. Reports say that the bomber was among the worshippers when the explosion went off around 11.15 this morning. Residents said several followers of the group, particularly women and children, were killed by the explosion as security forces have presently cleared off the area to prevent further attacks. The Yobo State Commissioner of Police, uh, Mr. Marcus Dunlady, who confirmed the incident, says a suicide bomber took advantage of the procession to carry out he started the act, but casualty figures are yet to be determined. The entire area in the meantime has been cordoned off by security men, and as residents remain in their various locations to avoid being victims of any further attacks. Opotiscom has been experiencing several bomb attacks with the last one before occurring two days after the Eid al-Fitri celebrations where worshippers were killed in two separate mosque attacks. Well, it's been more than three weeks since the Nigerian military announced a ceasefire with the Boko Haram insurgents. However, recent attacks on towns in northeastern Nigeria have shown that the group lacks any sincerity in the deal. However, analysts like the former permanent secretary at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Ambassador Joe Keshi, believe that all hope is not lost, although the Boko Haram sect refuses to honor the agreement. People need to remember when you look at the history of such negotiations that uh, it, it takes a very long time. Remember that during the Liberian Sierra Leone War, for example, we negotiated 19 times, had 19 agreements with Taylor, none worked. With the Fully Sankar group, similar thing, none worked until we were able to pin him down. In fact, in the case of Fully Sankar, we call that after he has signed an agreement with um, in Ivory Coast, he left the capital city, got to the airport, repudiated the agreement, and came to Nigeria where he was arrested. And that's all the stage that Nigeria managed it and eventually were able to make peace. So it's, it, it, this is the nature of what happens in negotiation like this. And when we actually did the Sevenian Peace Talk also, it took us one good month sitting in Togo, talking with the various factions before we could get them together. So for me, there's something very really strange, but I think there was some sincerity along the line. It's interesting because this, this deal was supposed to bring some assurance to Nigerians. I mean, hearing it, they were supposed to, you know, be assured that you know at least uh, some people's lives would be saved up north. But you think the military should have kept quiet about this until probably they had started, you know, the execution of the ceasefire? In a way, I think they were. But you don't blame them. Maybe they did that based on the level of assurance that was given to them by those that they are talking to. Now, let me make this very clear again, as I was saying before, that cast your mind back to a place like Colombia. Some people were held in Colombia for long, long years, up to 11 years. Even negotiations, they, they, they were able to, you know, they were promised, but they will not release them. I, I think the mistake that has been made in our own case was that from the beginning, we gave the uh, we, we probably did not understand the nature and the dynamic of this crisis. And we gave the impression that it's something that could be resolved overnight. But the truth of the matter is that crisis like this runs its own full cycle. You can watch more of that interview with Ambassador Joe Keshi tonight on Diplomatic Channel. It airs at 8.30. To other stories here in Africa, although there's been no case of the Ebola virus disease in Singapore, well, this is just outside the country, though, but Singapore's government, Singapore's government is taking proactive steps to prevent an importation of the virus. Now, from Wednesday, citizens of West African, Ebola, West African countries hit by the Ebola virus will be required to apply for a visa to enter the country. A reason for this, according to the Health Ministry, is that the visa requirements would allow for easy oversight and tracing. Authorities have been cautious of a possible outbreak in the city-state and major transport hub, which was hit by the SARS virus in 2003. 
Meanwhile, French Health Minister Marisol Touraine has confirmed the transfer of a UNICEF health worker suffering from Ebola from Sierra Leone to a hospital in Paris for treatment. The UN worker, whose name and nationality have not yet been disclosed, was transported to France aboard a specially equipped jet and placed in isolation at the Begging Military Hospital in eastern Paris, a suburb of saint mond It says the second Ebola sufferers have received treatments in France since the start of the epidemic ravaging West Africa. A French nurse repatriated in September has since made a full recovery from the virus, which has killed almost 5,000 people. France does have 12 equipped hospitals ready to take in any suspected Ebola cases. We'll take another break on the world today. When we come back, uh, a woman decides on whether she lives or dies. Please join us again. Welcome back to the world today. Uh, an auction house in New Zealand has decided to put uh, two fake forgeries under much consideration and not being sold in the country. That's because local media had reported that the oil paintings, imitations of Claude Monet's at uh, Giverny and in the woods at Giverny were initially thought to be the work of renowned forger Elmir de Hoy, but they turned out to be fake fakes in the end. Auckland auction house Cordes was contacted last month by a de Hoy expert, Mark Forger, who said that they had really been painted by London bookmaker Ken Talbot. So both paintings were promptly removed from sale. Hungarian-born Elmi de Hoy was considered a master forger after reportedly selling more than a thousand fake pieces to galleries and collectors around the world. And now to the story that's been making headlines, especially in the United States, as a young woman, a 29-year-old Brittany Maynard, became the public face of the controversial Right to Die movement, ending her life on Saturday at her home in Portland, Oregon. She took medication to end her life under Oregon's Death with Dignity Act Advocacy Group Compassion and Choices, uh, which reported the story. The 29-year-old Maynard had been married a year when she discovered that she had an aggressive brain cancer. In a statement, uh, the Advocacy Group uh, Compassion and Choices uh, said that uh, they've been working closely with her and uh, she intended she died uh, as she intended, which was peacefully in her bedroom in the arms of her loved ones. That is the and that's the world today. Thank you for watching. I am Amarachi Ubani.